I want to thank everyone for being here uh, on what I'm sure is going to be a eventful week, we hope. Um, if not, that means we have to do it probably again next week or in the future. So uh, I know all of you uh, hope, and I know our conference hopes we have an on-time budget, but uh, some news came out uh, last week after we left the new list of judicial, uh, I guess, judicial nominees eligible for the governor to nominate for chief judge. And uh, just to take us back, uh, although I know many of you covered it very well, and I want to thank our conference, including my colleague Senator Palumbo, for filing that lawsuit that forced the Senate Democrats to perform and fulfill their constitutionally obligated duty and put Judge LaSalle on the floor for a full vote, uh, something that our conference felt was not only right constitutionally, but was right mm. in practice, was right ethically, uh, and should have been how it worked from the beginning. In fact, we wasted a lot of time, uh, resources, but time, uh, and now the court still does not, of course, have a chief justice. They have an acting chief justice, but not a permanent chief justice. Um, and now we have a new list. And we have a new list, and we know, we know, no matter what my colleagues across the aisle may say, we know that they have a responsibility to put, once the governor nominates a justice, they have an obligation, yes, he, he or she will be vetted through the Judiciary Committee and go through that process again, but then that nominee will go to the floor for a full vote. And our conference stands ready uh, to be part of that process. We believe, and I'm not going to get into uh, the different candidates today. We're st I know I'm still looking at their bios. Some of them I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with, some of them I'm not. Um, and I'm sure some of my colleagues, depending on where they're from, may know them uh, somewhat uh, as well. But the point of this is our conference stands by that we should be part of this process. They obviously should get a, fl a full floor vote. Senators shouldn't, in my view, come out and say, I'm not going to support this person, we're not going to support that person, we're not going to entertain that person. My colleagues across the aisle, they want an activist court. They want a court that reflects the political whims of the moment, and particularly the political whims of the far left. We do not believe that. We think that the court should, judges, and I think a chief judge, especially at the highest level, should interpret the law. There's 41 lawmakers over there and 21 lawmakers, or 42 over there, 21 over here. If we want to change the law or make a new law, we have that ability. Judges are not supposed to make laws. Judges are not supposed to widen the strike zone. Judges are supposed to interpret the law as it is written and uphold it and protect the integrity of that law. That is something that I know my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, after vetting him, after speaking to him, they felt Judge LaSalle would do that. The governor thought Judge LaSalle would do that. I would tell you that our colleagues in the Democratic Conference also thought Judge LaSalle would do that, and that's why they rejected him, because it wasn't good enough. They wanted a more activist judge. Um, but again, I, I encourage the governor, in the interest of time and the importance of the court, to nominate someone quickly and begin this process uh, of, of, of getting a judge, a chief judge, uh, approved through the Judiciary Committee, through the full Senate for a vote, and certainly our conference stands ready to play a role in that process. And with that, um, I want to thank again, I want to thank Senator Palumbo, I want to thank all the members, Senator Martins, uh, Senator Rhodes, Senator O'Mara, um, Senator Lanza, who I know couldn't be here, Senator Patricia Canzanari Fitzpatrick, who couldn't be here, who I'm missing on judiciary. Is that everybody on judiciary? Okay. I want to thank all the Judiciary Committee members for their round one and round two of work, and now round three coming up, um, and we'll see if that's the last round of this process. But all my colleagues um, for conducting themselves, I think, in a way that was how, the, how this process should be. They didn't come out and say, we don't like this person or I have an issue. We were willing to ask the questions, consider the nominee, and then ultimately make a vote on the floor, uh, which we did and which we will do again. So I want to thank everyone and then certainly turn it over to questions. We'll do on topic first, Karen, if that's all right, and then we can do. I mean, you say that there should be done before the budget was settled, or you 
I guess it depends on when the budget's done, right, Karen? Right? If, if the budget's done in May, we should probably get on this uh, right quick. I think, it, I mean, realistically, I think it's going to be tough to accomplish all of what we're talking about this week, right? I just think that's not realistic. Um, we could have had this already done had it had the the initial process moved uh, not only more in a timely way, but in the, in the way it should have gone. If he had moved to the floor immediately after judiciary then we might have already been, we, are, we already might be further along now and have a permanent chief judge. But, um, uh, but I, I think there's no question in my mind this will come up in budget, I, I can't believe that it won't. Um, and that'll be interesting to see where that goes, you know, how that, how that proceeds uh, between the governor, uh, certainly in the majority. But again, we want it to be known that we, uh, both to the governor and to the public, that we're ready to play a part, uh, our role in this process as well. Nick? Who would you think about names on that list that were proposed? Uh, you know, did, did you see anybody who in the conference could potentially vote for it? So we obviously haven't had time to conference that, Nick, so I, I don't want to I, I don't want to get ahead of, of the members of the conference. Uh, there's only one, uh, there's one member that I know, or one nominee that I know, because she's from the Buffalo area, which is uh, Justice uh, Judge Troutman. Um, who I think we actually confirmed maybe a year and a half ago or something like that because I was uh, in the I was the the minority leader at that time so it can't be too long ago but um, the other members yeah I'm going through their bios don't know them um, and again we're going to speak to both our judiciary members and our conference as they get all the bios and I want to give them a chance to really sort of delve into uh, I'm I'm I have no doubt there'll be a, a judge or two or maybe more that our conference has real concerns with. Um, but I, I, I'm hopeful that there's at least a, a, a nominee on there that our conference could consider supporting. But it depends on who the governor, ultimately, it's not like it's, it's all seven. The governor gets her pick of that, of that list, and then that's the member, the nominee we have to consider. So we have to sort of you know, go off of ultimately who she selects. Uh, but certainly, we'll conference it. And if the governor uh, you know, asks my opinion, I'd be happy to give it to her. Well, I think it, I think it's clear that it has to. Uh, I know my colleagues would like to say that they were kind enough to bring it to the floor to to end the distraction. Um, and look, at governing can be distracting sometimes from the job of politics. But uh, but the reality is, I think it's very clear that it has to go to the floor. So our expectation is that it absolutely will go to the floor or we'll do what we have to do again to ensure that it does. But I think the governor certainly expects now that it will go to the floor, and I think my colleagues um, would be wise to, to see that it does or make sure that it does. Um, but as far as how it'll play differently, I think that depends. It depends on a lot of factors uh, and people not in this room. Or it depends on who the governor selects. Um, it depends on, on uh, Senator Hoylman as chair of Judiciary Committee. Is he going to... You know, he made some comments that I thought were really out of line uh, about, you know, someone, uh, judge ever running with the conservative endorsement. The conservative party has an event tonight, uh, obviously outside of these halls that I'll be happy to attend. Uh, he says that's, that's a non-starter. Um, now, he clarified it's a non-starter for him. But, um, you know, I, I'm sure I have colleagues that aren't big on people who run the working families line, but they don't make comments that this judge you know, I won't even consider that. You have to look at the judge's record. You have to look at how they've ruled. You have to look at, you know, how they've done their job. That's more important than whatever their personal political proclivities may or may not be. And I think that's one thing we're going to look to. But, you know, certainly um, I hope that this is different in that it's more efficient, you know, that it moves more, more quickly, and that the governor obviously puts up somebody uh, that, again, will ad ad adhere to the law both federally, you know, there was a big talk last time about Judge LaSalle and his support of the First Amendment. Um, I like judges who support the First Amendment. I think it's a good thing. Um, and I think uh, a lot of other people would too, if you were in that position. So we want judges who are gonna adhere to the, to the, to the Constitution federally, also New York State law. Yes. Well, we'll do, all, not yet. We'll, I, wanna, I wanna make sure we close this out and then we'll be happy to go to off topic. Zach? So a lot has been said on the other side of the aisle about how the court of appeals and the court system in general is in need of an overhaul and upgrade. 
mm -hmm. these are rational. Uh, I'm sure you have a different vision of them, but do you agree with them on that point? And to what extent would that consideration of the need for a new leader for the Court of Appeals play into your thinking on that, whoever the government is? So I, I do not think, you know, I, I think it's dangerous when you talk about the courts needing an overhaul or a new direction, because it's a direction that is politically aligned with them. And the courts are not supposed to be instruments of the political winds of the moment. They're supposed to uphold the integrity of the law. And that protects people who might not be favored by the political winds that are blowing in that direction. And that's true, by the way, no matter who's in charge. Um, and I firmly believe in that. So when they talk about uh, an overhaul, maybe it's because they continue to lose in court, even with Democratic nominated judges, meaning Democratic governors have nominated these judges. I don't think it's stacked. You know, they want to pretend the current court is a conservative court. You all cover, you're all smart enough. The, the high court in New York State is not a conservative court by almost any reasonable political definition. However, I have to give them credit. They've upheld the law in a number of cases, even when it's gone against maybe some of their fellow Democrats in the state legislature, because that's what a court's job is to do. If they're passing laws that are unconstitutional, if they're passing laws that are not in keeping with current laws on the books, then it's gonna get struck down. So maybe they should stop passing unconstitutional laws, or maybe they shouldn't, you know, they, they should just take their, their medicine that they tried to gerrymander, you know, Senate and congressional lines and, and accept that defeat, because that's a, a, a part of this, obviously. I think they're still smarting from some of these, de these defeats and rather than take accountability, they want to pass it on to Justice Di Fiori or, the, or these, these, you know, this bench of unelected justices who no one knows, of course, uh, the average person. And so I think you know, this is about um, courts are there to uphold the law and protect very often people who, who might be in the minority of whatever, whatever political climate we're talking about. Uh, and I think we saw that in Justice LaSalle's nomination and I hope we see that in whoever this comes out. But I think it's, you know, while not surprising, I, I think it's dangerous when we hear about state senators talking about overhauling the court or remaking the court in the image that they would like. Because that is not the role of the court here in New York or the court in any state uh, or any country. When uh, Democrats are describing what's going on in the United States, they're saying that Republicans are placing folks who are yeah, so let, let's, I don't want to get in like a, a, a history lesson, but the, the Supreme Court has obviously gone, there's been liberal courts and conservative courts. Um, and that's a reflection very often of who controls Congress and the U.S. Senate and who's in the White House. Um, and so, you know, there'll be a liberal court again, I'm certain, uh, at some point. Um, but I disagree with the characterization. Those justices have all been appointed or gone through the proper process without, um, you know, some of the comments that we've seen here. So I don't think that the court in New York is, is supposed to be a, a countermeasure to the Supreme Court. Uh, that's how my, some of my colleagues see it. I think the court here is supposed to be to uphold the law and protect New Yorkers under that law and interpret that law. And if my colleagues across the aisle want to change those laws, they can do that. They certainly can do that. You all know the, the lay of the land here. They, they could probably change most any law you know, that they wanted to. Uh, they certainly could have changed the laws that they had an issue uh, regarding Justice LaSalle, but they didn't. They didn't. It was more convenient to attack him and, and his reputation uh, as a justice. So, um, you know, I, I disagree with the idea that somehow um, the Supreme Court is what's driving their determination here. The Supreme Court has, uh, at least recently, um, has protected the constitutional rights of New Yorkers. However inconvenient or unpopular those issues may be on the other side or may even poll because that's not what a judge is supposed to do. He doesn't look at the polls or she doesn't look at the poll and say, based on this poll, I'm gonna vote or rule this way. That is not how it works. And so, you know, uh, I know they, that might be inconvenient for some of my colleagues, but um, you know, I think that at the end of the day, we need judges here in New York 
where we have, obviously we have a democratically controlled state, Democratic governor, Democratic Senate, Democratic Assembly, um, but we need a judge who is going to uphold, whether it's the federal constitution, the state constitution, or state laws, again, however inconvenient or however, however out of line they are with political uh, uh, preferences, whether it's in Siena or Rasmussen or every other polling agency you're looking at. I would welcome uh, the governor, you know, if she reached out um, and, and would be happy to, uh, to discuss, uh, after discussing with my conference, I would be happy to, to discuss uh, with her if she sought my opinion. Um, I can't speak to whether she has reached out to these uh, Senate Democrats or not. Any more on topic? Okay, off topic. So, um, in the governor's budget, something that I can possibly see that um, there's a change regarding how um, renewal energy studies are assessed. <coughs> Essentially, it would bring the state um, office of renewal, renewal energy studies into the process, supersede some local government control, mm -hmm. and for this. Um, and so local uh, legislators up in the North Country are definitely going to lawsuit to um, stop this. I just wanted to ask if you were aware of this change and what uh, the Senate Republicans uh, views on this change. So I'm tangentially aware of it, um, but I can tell you that, um, I think I speak for our conference, we, and you've seen this trend, this is not unique to this thing, this trend that this state has uh, recently where, you know, you hear a lot about superseding local zoning, superseding local laws, um, all in the name of something, something you know, uh, of high purpose, no doubt. Um, but we are a home rule state, first of all, and secondly, as a former mayor, and there's a lot of our colleagues uh, who were local officials, um, I think the local government knows best what the constituents in that community want, certainly better than anybody in this city or in this building. And so I get, uh, I'm very much opposed, I'll speak for myself and I think the conference, very much opposed to attempts by Albany um, whether it's on renewables, climate, or, or tax policy, or housing policy, or uh, you know, eviction policy, any of these policies, there's a number of them, that would seek to supersede or overrule local laws, local ordinances, local zoning, really the will of local voters and taxpayers, um, because Albany knows best, uh, which I, when I think most of us would agree and point to various examples where that's not the case. So we, we would be, I think, reflexively and philosophically opposed to those kinds of measures. Yeah, yeah, you know. You know, I guess anything to make me less watch less TV, right, Nick? But, um, you know, it's, un it, it's really almost unbelievable we just continue, I believe, to double down on the very things that have made New York a state that business people say, don't invest there. Don't expand your business there. Move somewhere else. I mean, this is something, that, you know, we talk a lot about tax policy on companies, and we talk about taxing, you know, uh, millionaires or billionaires, but this is a tax on regular New Yorkers across the state. Because we, everybody watches, everyone now has Netflix, they have Hulu, they have what, you know, whatever streaming service, uh, and they're watching their favorite show, and that might be their, their escape with their family on a Friday night, or it might be their escape from whatever is going on in their life, or their job, or what have you, or from watching the news about it going on here in Albany. And instead, we're going we're gonna to tax them. I, it just defies logic that... Even this, it's almost like we're looking for what haven't we taxed? What's moving still? Tax that. Let's go get some money for there. $236 billion. $236 billion is going to be is what the, the Senate one house, or $237 billion. And we'll see. We're going to be at $230 billion, I, I guess, in round numbers. Um, and we have to continue to find new ways to tax people. And then there's a bill that would tax Amazon deliveries. I mean... Again, I know my colleagues, you know, they just hate Amazon, 
Um, but what I remember about Amazon deliveries was in the pandemic, that was how people got basic goods and services. When all a lot of other places were closed, they got critical things for their home, for their families, as a result of you know, Amazon or anyone else that delivered something to their house. And we want to tax that too. We're just gonna, we are going to tax this state into oblivion. We're going to tax people out of this state, and eventually there won't be enough money left to continue to tax. And then we're going to be in a real interesting quandary when there's not enough folks who, who, who are here to continue to pay um, all these taxes. So I, I, I just think it, it, it's, it's almost satire, Nick. It's almost funny, except if it wasn't true, uh, that New York is looking to tax that. Uh, you know, we should be looking at other states, not California, but other states who, you know, who are drawing people to their, to their state. From New York in a lot of cases, but just in general. Because um, people aren't stupid. They see stuff like this and they think, you know what? Who needs it? Who needs it? So. Eric Adams is in the only today. Um, I heard he is not meeting the Republican legislative leaders, but um, if you were able to talk to them there, what would you hope are the issues that you would bring up from the Democrats? Well, I hope he's talking about crime and bail um, and changes to bail. There's probably no mayor in the state that has dealt more with the disastrous, soft on crime, coddling of criminals, focus, obsession with those who have broken the law and making sure that, that more people are on the street instead of making sure they're, you know, where they can't harm people um, than Eric Adams, mo you know, most acutely. And so I have to believe if he's here, I'm sure there's a range of issues that the mayor of New York City is going to talk to his, uh, his uh, legislative leaders about. Uh, but uh, I hope he is pressing to them that they have to really get serious and consider these changes to bail. Um, and the public, set, the, the, the public polling says that, not just in New York City, but across the state of New York. And so I'm hoping that's an issue that he is driving home to his colleagues. Yeah, um, well, it's, you know, I mean, look at, like, Mayor Bloomberg has uh, a lot of money and you can't take it with you, so I guess you gotta spend it on something, right? So, um, and, you know, uh, he's, I guess, free to, to spend his money to promote, uh, whether it's the budget or certain policies, but uh, I think it shows you that, that the governor um, is concerned about her agenda getting, you know, getting in a final budget. I don't remember anything like this in the past where there was a public, uh, like TV commercials and stuff like that for a budget. Usually uh, the governor, you know, the governor sort of lays out the narrative and, and with blind folks like yourself and then the, the legislature, you know, the Senate and the assembly sort of, you know, say what they're going to say and you sort of get, get to it that way. So, um, but I guess I would, I would, I would, I wonder how much, how much is a TV commercial really moving I mean, most, most people in my experience, you know, this stuff is all, the transparency here is zero when it comes to the budget. So we, the, the average person doesn't even know what's really being discussed here. So I don't, I don't know that the TV commercial is going to move enough people to reach out to their senator and, and, you know, maybe get something in the budget or not. So it might just be a lot of money down the drain for, for Mike Bloomberg. Okay, great. Thank you so much. One more. We'll do one more in the back. I did, I did see it, at least I saw the gist of it, or I saw some aspects of it. So, you know, look, there's things in there that, that our conference has been talking about for a long time, right? You, crime, we know about bail. Um, uh, I know there was uh, something there about uh, flavored tobacco, um, you know, and I, and I think, look, I think if you, if you ask most people uh, where they are on, you know, tobacco's bad, right? Flavored tobacco is bad. Most people, I think, think of tobacco uh, as a bad thing, and so I'm not surprised that tobacco doesn't pull well, whether it's flavored or unflavored. Um, you know, I, I think there are bigger topics in the budget. You know, I'm not saying that's not an important one, but I think between the spending, between bail, between good cause eviction, um, which is, seems to be gaining strength 
uh, which I think is really problematic. Um, you know, you, you, the governor wants more housing, and yet we're doing, we're, we are literally doing things that is going to make less housing available because there'll be less housing built. For the very reason where there's not enough affordable housing now, because it's expensive to build housing in New York. And we double, on one hand we say affordability is an issue, and yet we continue to raise taxes on streaming services. And, and, and goods are delivered at someone's door. And then at the same time we say we need more housing built, but then we're going to do things that's going to ensure that it's not built. You know, it's not enough to just say you care about people. That's great. Compassion, empathy, you have to have a caring. But you also have to be smart enough to know how to help those people. And many of my colleagues just apparently lack that second quality because they continue to push policies that are going to have the exact opposite effect that they say they're trying to achieve. So, um, you know, I think that, like I said, the Santa poll, there were some uh, mixed, mixed bag of things, nothing very surprising in there. I think things that we've known for a while now and that you've seen sort of bear out in elections and, and in the media and from elected officials. So uh, we'll see if our colleagues uh, adhere to any of those uh, data points. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody.